Welcome to my YouTube channel. I'm delighted to welcome back for part four on our mini series on the Bible, Bible teacher, Mike Beaumont. Mike Bowman, welcome back to Facing the Canon. Great to be with you once again. It really is great to have you. Just to remind all of our audience that this is a four part series and we've reached part four, uh, looking at the Bible. What is the Bible? We've looked at the Old Testament. We've looked at the Gospels and the Book of Acts. And today, Mike, we're gonna focus on the letters and the Book of Revelation. Okay, epistles, what does that word mean? Epistle is quite, quite simply a, a word meaning letter. And there are s actually a significant part of the New Testament is letters, letters written from the early apostles to specific churches, or in some cases to specific individuals on a whole range of topics. And they're really all about how does this Christianity thing work? Does it work in real life, in everyday life? And so we find a whole number of situations that the apostles will address. address. Sometimes they've arisen out of an issue or a problem that's come, sometimes out of pressure or attack that's come on the church. But each time in all of the letters, we are seeing for me, hey, Christianity works, it engages with real life and with real people. Mike, how many letters are we talking about? Um, we're talking about 21 letters, uh, the bulk of which were written by Paul, but others by uh, the early apostles. And which apostles would they be? Well, Paul is one of the main writers. We've got Peter, who's written two of the letters. We've got John, who's written three, and we've got James, who's written one. There's the letter to Hebrews, which is completely anonymous. We've no idea who wrote that one at all. Uh, and then there's a little one tucked away, uh, which is Jude. Paul wrote a number of letters, yeah. Mike. What's the emphasis of what Paul was trying to communicate? I think what he wanted people to see was that, as I said earlier, that Faith in Christ works in life and in a whole range of different cultural contexts. You know, very often we talk about the New Testament letters, but they were written to very different settings, very different cities, very different regions at times. Some, as I've said, to churches, some to individuals. And so they're addressing a whole number of, of different issues like what do I do if I've had a slave and he's become a Christian and, and I've become a Christian? What, what on earth do I do now? This, this really mattered in the ancient world through to how do I live in a godless city like Corinth? What, what can I do that my friends do and what can I not do any longer now because I am a follower of Jesus? So they really are very much applied to life. And as I've said, they they're into a whole number of different settings and different issues. And that's why I love them. They are so varied and they all show following Jesus works. There is always a solution to every situation, in every culture, in every place, in every time, Jesus has an answer for it and his Holy Spirit can help us find that. And many of the letters are very pastoral, but also practical as you have suggested there. Uh, Mike, it, it's been said over the years by many that the God of the Old Testament mm. is different to the God of the New Testament. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and my answer to people who say that is, have you ever read the Bible? And I understand what they're trying to say. The answer, the, sorry, the the statement is often summed up is the, the God of the Old Testament is an angry God who's always waving a stick at us and waiting for us just to step out of line before he thwacks us. 
And in the New Testament, we get Jesus who comes along with his message of, you know, why, why don't you believe in God and be nice to one another? And these two are poles apart. Well, nothing could be further from the truth. You know, there are two sides to God's character that I think we in the modern West in particular find hard to hold together. We love that side of God is love. We're not so keen on the side of God is holy and has certain requirements. But do you know what? You can find both of those in both Testaments. So one of my favourite passages in the Old Testament is when Moses goes up the mountain to meet with God, Exodus 34, 6 and 7, and God himself reveals his nature to Moses. The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands, and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. Wow, what a gracious God. Now let me take you to the New Testament and Jesus' own teaching at the end of the parable of the, of the servants who failed to use their talents wisely. Take that worthless servant and throw him out into the outer darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. There you've got the very opposite of what you've suggested some people think the Bible says. You see, both sides can be fair. These are not two different gods. These are not two different stories. Actually, the whole of the New Testament is the continuation, the completion, the fulfilment of the story that that one same God began in the Old Testament. So I don't find any disparity between the two Testaments at all. And any supposed conflict of pictures of what God is like simply fails to read the text and let it speak for itself in all its breadth in both of the Testaments. Mike, some have said that the Old Testament emphasis is on works, whereas the New Testament emphasis is on grace. Uh, what, what do they mean by that, works and grace? And do you agree? Yeah, that how do we get right with God by works, by what we do, by our life, by our good deeds is what is meant by that. And certainly by New Testament times, there was quite an emphasis on the importance of works. But as I've said in a previous episode, you know, one of the big things we often get wrong about the Old Testament uh, is that Jews felt they were put right with God by what they do. They didn't. Paul takes us right back to Abraham again and again in his letters. Galatians 3 is one example where he does that, where he reminds us that Abraham was put right with God by faith and that the works then followed. If you've really encountered the living God, you can't live the same way anymore. You've got to start changing. Your life will be different. Let that be seen in your works, in what you do. And Paul was very clear that that's how Old Testament faith had started. Now, yes, there was drift. Uh, and certainly by New Testament times, there had become such an emphasis on the importance of the works as identifying markers of who Israel was, that the works themselves had almost become the important thing rather than the identifying markers. So the the conflict between the two is, is, is somewhat false. And Paul reminds them, no, how has God put people right with himself? It's always been by faith, but that faith has to find itself expressed in how we live. Um, I love Paul's letter to the Ephesians, yeah. Galatians, Romans. I mean, there are so many passages that come to mind, uh, you know, Galatians 5, uh, Romans 8. Uh, what, what stands out for you? Oh, my goodness, how do I choose? Well, you mentioned Romans 8. I, I probably um, picked that one up because uh, it was a passage that I learned as a young Christian where Paul talks about the God who works all things together for good for those that love Christ Jesus. You know, what can separate us from his love? Absolutely nothing. So there are some incredible sort of purple passages, aren't they? Special little gems in the midst of it. But you know what I've found over the years is these gems of passages that all of us have become even more gems when we put them back into their setting. Yes. You know, if someone has a diamond, you might look at it and think, oh, that's very nice. But when a diamond really 
comes to life is when a master craftsman puts it into a ring, puts it into a setting, and suddenly the whole thing comes alive. And I think it's the same for these favourite New Testament verses. There are so many that are precious in the letters, but it's often when you put them back into their setting and the context of the whole letter that then you go not just wow, but double wow. Can we, can we do that now, Mike? Do that with Romans 8, verse 28. Could you put that for us in its context? Well, one of the things that had happened in Rome was that shortly before Paul wrote that letter, um, Jews had been expelled from Rome. There had been riots in the city and the emperor had blamed the Jews for it. And along with that expulsion of Jews, that would have included Christian Jews. So they've been expelled. What are you left with now in the church? You are left with Gentile Christians. And it looks like, scholars think, what was going on there was the Gentile Christians that thought, ah, all the Jews have been expelled, including our Jewish Christian brothers and sisters. Clearly, this is God's judgment on them. Clearly, God has finished with the Jewish people. And actually, the whole of Romans, it looks like Paul was tackling that issue because as the Jews started to drift back, which they were doing by the time Paul was writing, it looks like some of the Christians were saying, well, actually, is there a place for them in our midst? And so what he does in Romans, and many Christians miss this bit because they're so keen on looking for the jewel rather than the whole thing. He says, is there any place for them? Wow, it's all come out of them. And so he shares the good news. He starts by sharing the bad news, doesn't he, in chapter one, and ending up by chapter three and saying, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Doesn't matter whether it's Jew or Gentile, everyone has sinned, but, God sent his son Jesus to die on the cross to pay the price of our sins, whether Jew or Gentile. There's not two ways of being saved, only one way. It's through Jesus. How do we make that our own? Chapter four, we make it our own through faith. Faith? Yeah, it's always been about faith. Going right back to Abraham, as he reminds them. Now, it's not just about us and our faith. It's also chapter five, about the work of the Holy Spirit within us who breaks down those barriers and brings us together. And so he's steadily working through. And by the time he gets to chapter eight, this lovely passage about, you know, God working all things together for good it is not just about, don't worry, John, in your life, yeah. God is always working all things together for good. Of course it means that. But in its setting, a much bigger even through what God had done through the Jewish people. God was not setting them aside forever. He was just, you'll get to in later chapters, 9, 10, and 11, where he gives three whole chapters to what about Israel. Some Christians have thought, I've actually seen commentaries where it says digression. I think it's not a digression. It's the heart of the letter he's explaining to them that God simply set Israel aside for a while, while he reached out to bring in many, many Gentiles. But at the end, many, many, many Jews will turn to Jesus and believe and become part of the one same family. And it's in that context that Paul can say, our God is a God who works all things together for good. He's thinking they're much wider than just John and Mike and what happens in our life. He's thinking of his big plan to bring together, you mentioned Ephesians, one people from himself, both Jew and Gentile, who at the end will be gathered around Jesus, who will have been saved by Jesus and only by Jesus. That's God's plan. And that's how he's working all things together for good to bring that about. And that's why in the final chapters of Romans, this is how I want you to live out that faith. And what Wonderful an encouragement letter. that is it, to us as believers uh, to take the truth of that and to persevere and to keep on keeping on. I, there's a great encouragement, isn't there, in those letters. Absolutely. Don't give up. Yeah. And so many of the letters do include that. I mean, Hebrews is one. Yes. Where 
very much not written by Paul there. We don't know who wrote that, but it's a very different Greek style to Paul's letters, so certainly wasn't him. Uh, and a letter there written to Jewish Christians who were being tempted under pressure and persecution to give up following Jesus and go back to their old Judaism. And the writer there will say, why on earth would you want to do that? You left your Judaism because you saw that Jesus was better. You know, he's better than angels, he's better than Moses, he's better than Joshua, he's got a better covenant, he's a better priest, he's a better sacrifice. Jesus is better. Now in light of that, keep going. Let's run the race with perseverance. Why? Because he's worthy and he is better. And we've got that great cloud oh, of witnesses yeah. Yeah. urging us on. Absolutely. So we have the epistles, these pastoral practical letters, and then we conclude the New Testament, the Bible, with the book of Revelation. What's the book of Revelation about? Well, that's the book where Christians start fighting, isn't it, Stadley? You know, first two chapters of the Bible and the last few chapters of the Bible sadly become a, a place for so much disagreement. And it really shouldn't be like that. You know, let's put the gem back into the setting again. Yes. And the setting of Revelation is that it was written towards the end of the first century scholars aren't quite sure, but around about 85 AD, where the state is beginning to turn against Christianity. I think this is very relevant because we're seeing that happen a lot today, particularly in Western societies that have been very pro-Christian for many years. And in that context of the state starting to turn against Christians and outright persecute them, those Christians needed hope. So the first thing we need to do with Revelation is not see it as a battle plan for World War III and everything that's going to happen at the end. It had to mean something to those people first. And telling people in the first century, I know you're being persecuted. I know several people have been martyred from your church, but don't worry, because in two and a half thousand years, uh, this, this, and this is going to happen and Jesus will come back. It would have meant nothing to them. So it's a letter full of hope to a persecuted people. And some of the keys for me that come out, and I think it's these things that we need to focus on rather than trying to do this meaningless exercise of work out dates and times, which, which Jesus himself said was a waste of time, is to focus on its key things. What are they? One, Jesus is on the throne. That is where the Apostle John sees him in his vision right at the beginning. He's on his throne, he's not let go of things and nothing that happens in this letter gets him off his throne. So Jesus is on his throne. But secondly, evil will grow and increase and some of those who love and trust Jesus will be persecuted. But don't worry, they are safe with him in heaven. And although the enemy will try his best through human means and spiritual means to bring down God's kingdom and all it stands for, at the end of human history, Jesus will return in great victory and glory, defeat them all, the devil will be cast into that fiery pit, the books will be opened in heaven and every human being who's ever lived will be judged before God based on their faith in Jesus. Sadly, for those who haven't put their faith in Jesus, there will be those words that we read in one of Jesus' parables, depart from me, I never knew you. But for those who've trusted in him, wow, what do we see at the end of Revelation? We see heaven coming down to earth, a renewed creation with Jesus in the midst. And we actually see him picking up the idea of the Garden of Eden what did human beings lose at the beginning? A beautiful garden. What do they regain at the end? A beautiful garden. Both of them with God in the midst. So this is an incredibly exciting, encouraging message to even when life gets tough. Jesus is on the throne. Come on, don't give in. Yeah, do you know what? Some of you may lose your lives over this, but we win. 
And, and also what comes across, Mike, is that we are talking about a God of love, of compassion, of mercy, but also of judgment. And he speaks to one of the churches because they're lukewarm. Yeah, absolutely. And he challenges them, doesn't he? And, he, you know, he says, you know, you're lukewarm. And because you lukewarm, I, I could spit you out of my mouth. And yes. To that particular church, there, there were hot springs up on the hills that got cooler and more filled with, with salts as it went down. And he's thinking of that, you know, it's lovely at the top, you know, if it's fresh or uh, the hot springs, but it's horrible when it's that sort of mixture and you go, Ugh, spit you out. And he's using that imagery that they would have well understood. But even though he says, you know, if you don't wake up, uh, I will spit you out of your mouth. It's still God at the end of each of those messages to the seven churches. He who has an ear here, come on, it's not too late. Come on. Wake up. This is not what I want for you. What I want for you yeah. is that you get my best and you wake up and you get in line and you become part of this exciting adventure and part of history and where it's going. Yeah. Don't harden your hearts. Don't, you know, unblock your ears. Yeah. Hear the good news. And, and there is an emphasis of his return. Come, Absolutely. Lord Jesus. Yeah. Come. Yeah. And so... It does inspire us to be a people who are anticipating and expecting the return of Christ. We don't talk much about that today. No, and do you know what? It's like people can fall into one of two extremes at times. Either we don't talk about it at all, or at the other end, people go overboard and every little thing that happens in life, you know, they're, they're hunting in Revelation or one of the Old Testament prophets to see if this is a fulfillment of something. And I think that the vast bolt, you know, sort of fits somewhere in between those and carry on with life. I have to say, for me personally, when the whole COVID thing came, it really brought home to me that we cannot assume that life just always continues on as ever. In a moment almost, wasn't it? The world shut down. In a moment, things yes. changed. In a moment, there was the threat that millions of people could lose their life. And I have to say, for me personally, I didn't see that as one of the plagues in the book of Revelation, but I saw it as God's wake-up call to think, you know, this is going to happen one day, and Jesus is most definitely coming back. He himself said it again and again, didn't he? And just that challenge to, to be alert and to, to be ready, uh, not to spend my life trying to find details and dates and times and seasons, and what's happening in Israel this week, or what's happened in Russia or China, but rather to have that constant readiness and alertness and to get on with it, to, to get on with the mission that we've been given of sharing the good news with Jesus who don't know him and who without knowing him will be lost at the end when God does open those books and doesn't find their name in his book of life. And how beautiful that picture of heaven, no more tears, yeah. no more pain, no more suffering. Yeah. That is just a beautiful picture. And the river of life flowing down and there being healing wherever it goes, a picture of wholeness, healing, completion. And the very fact it's a city, of course, you know, in, in ancient times, um, people didn't live in cities quite like they did today. You know, pretty much everyone in a town or city. Cities were often places that you retreated to when your country was attacked. A lot of people, the vast majority of the Roman Empire were people who worked farms out in the countryside. You retreated to the city for what? safety, protection, and the whole imagery of the city at the end is that this beautiful place that you've described will be the most secure, protected place ever. Why? Because God, because the Lord Jesus, because the Holy Spirit will be right there in the middle of it and Eden will once again be restored. So in some ways, um, Revelation isn't the end. It's the new beginning. Absolutely. It's the beginning to what God had planned for us, to actually to what he had planned right from the beginning, that Adam and Eve messed up. A place where God's presence was 
tangible way. There's that beautiful image, isn't there, in the Garden of Eden story with God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And what do Adam and Eve do? They run and hide from him because they've disobeyed. But, but God wants to walk among us in that cool of the day. And it's a restoration of that relationship that God wanted with people from the beginning and that he will have again at the end. I'm so looking forward to it. Mike, thank you so much for producing so many helpful resources to help us uh, with our understanding of the Bible. And one that I really like is the New Lion Bible Encyclopedia. Tell us about this. Um, it's a book that really helps to, I, I talked about the diamonds and the settings earlier, and, and that's a book that helps a lot with the setting of the big picture by introducing readers to something of the culture and the background and the history and life of the times to get them into seeing what life was like. And there's all sorts of stuff covered about empires and fishermen and what was grown and things like this. So it, it really is encyclopedic in, in covering the, the whole background of life that helps the Bible come alive. And you know, the more we can help to get this book alive by seeing it's not dead stories, it was with real people and real events. And uh, that little encyclopedia is full of lots of, uh, sorry, it's, it's full of lots of coloured pictures and maps as well. So it's not just all text, very, very readable, the sort of thing you could have on a coffee table and browse through as well. Uh, but it will help just with that whole thing of the settings of what life was like in Bible times. Mike. It's just been fascinating, this four-part series of looking at the Holy Book, the Word of God, God's Word. Thank you for joining us on Facing the Canon and just illustrating it, illuminating it to us a little bit more. Thank you. It's been my genuine delight and pleasure. And if out of this between us, we can just encourage some of God's people to pick up this book and start reading it and believing that in it they can encounter more of the living God, well, it will have been worthwhile, won't it, John? Amen, Mike. Well, I hope that has done that for you. I hope it really has warmed your heart and I hope it's kind of inspired you uh, to dig deep into God's Word. Uh, this is the only, only data, the reliable data that we have about God this is the book that we can read along with the author. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us on Facing the Canon. Please join us again.